We know from previous discussions in the integrated rangeland management class that stocking rate is very important. It's the kind of fundamental decision that a, a person makes in terms of management. In this PowerPoint, uh, we're going to look at just the details of how you might actually set a stocking rate, what kind of numbers that looks like. So this is Karen Lodgeball at the University of Idaho. Let's set a stocking rate. I'm going to, this is a very diagrammatic kind of method. It's what, what I call the four step method. It's based after some work by Dr. Holacek at New Mexico State University. Just try to simplify the process. There's no perfect way to do this. This is just one process that could be used. Okay, with this four step method, you, do, you um, first uh, for, um, calculate the forage demand and then you see uh, if, what's your supply and you put those two things together. So calculate usable forage, you calculate any restrictions to the use of that forage or accessibility. Then you look at the demand of the animal and finally you'll calculate the stocking rate. The okay, forage demand method is, is not something we use all the time. We really only use it when we have no other stocking rate information from previous years. Generally, we know how anim many animals were stocked in the last year or several years and we just look to see how the range is doing and whether that stocking rate seems appropriate or not. But sometimes we don't have much information or we just want to see if we're on track and we might use this forage demand method um, to estimate the carrying capacity in a biological survey or land appraisal you might use this method um, because it's um, it, it isn't based on history or management it is just based on biology when considering changes in classes of animals you might also use this um, method because you might be grazing cattle, for example, and decide you want to graze sheep and you need to know what the stocking rate might look like for those uh, sheep. Step one, calculate the usable supply. You start with some estimate of biomass. Uh, the weight of biomass per acre times the area would equal the total biomass that you have. And, and how do you get total biomass or uh, biomass per acre? You would get it by clipping plots uh, or you might get it by looking in the soil survey. Uh, where they have estimates of uh, what production there might be on a, a unfavorable normal or or favorable year so those are places you might start either by going out and collecting the data or, or by looking in some book values uh, such as on the web soil survey and then you would convert this total biomass into usable forage so moving from the total biomass time times that proper use factor we talked about that in the previous lecture um, how much do you intend to use of the available forage? And then you would get the usable forage supply. So here's an example. If you manage 1,200 acres, you have 760 pounds per acre, and it's located in the Intermountain Bunch Grass, and, and you've, you decide you're going to remove about 40% of the annual biomass. So 40% is your proper use factor. What is your forage supply? Do the math. At 1,200 acres times 760 pounds per acre equals 912,000 pounds of biomass. You multiply that times your 40% proper use factor and you get 364,800 pounds of usable forage. Now the step two is where you um, adjust some of the forage to, for accessibility. You, you look to see if it's truly accessible. And two good examples, uh, and these are just examples of how you might adjust uh, the forage available due to slope or distance to water. Uh, these are, are really just raw um, averages or, or guidelines. You need to know your livestock situation better to determine what area of the pasture is or is not accessible because of slope or distance to water. But for example, if you had any slopes in your pasture that were generally rolling 0 to 10 to 15 percent a slope there'd be no reduction that's accessible forage to every type of animal 15 to 30 uh, for cattle that might start to have some restrictions so you might reduce um, the forage available um, by 30 percent only 70 percent of it is available uh, that would matter of what species it is for example 30 15 to 30 percent slope might not be accessible to cattle but would be totally accessible to sheep and goats if you get in higher uh, slopes like 31 to 60 for cattle you would have a 60% reduction. Most of that's not usable. It's hard for animals to get onto those slopes. So only 40% of the forage is usable. And if you get slopes over 60%, that's really steep. It's you know more than a 45% incline. And um, this these guidelines would say that's it just don't even consider that usable. So remove any forage that's growing on those slopes. Distances to water, again for cattle on kind of gently rolling 
uh, areas you might think of, of things like um, all areas within a mile of water are accessible. When you get to one to two miles from water, about half of that forage is available. Two to three miles of water, uh, only 75% of that forage is available. I'm sorry, so there's a 75% reduction, so about 25% of it's available. And over three miles, it's really not available. So you would remove from your total biomass any acres that were greater than three miles from water. So those are just guidelines, just examples. Again, you'd need to know your animals to uh, to, to really calculate those numbers. Um, again, th these are guidelines, not rules. They depend on the animal species, the breed, the experience, the t topography, how you know how good the soil is, for example, how strong the soil is, the seasons. Some years animals will use steeper slopes than others and how much forage moisture there is. For example, if there's a lot of forage moisture, animals can travel quite far from water. Uh, this picture on the right is some picture of some cattle uh, grazing above Regan's where the, the land's very steep. And those animals are really used to using steep uh, slopes. So they have the background and experience to use those slopes. Then the third step is to calculate the forage demand for animals in your herd. So the intake uh, of animals was discussed in a previous lecture, but just in, in summary, let's say that horses eat about 3% of their body weight on a yearly average. Ruminants would eat about 2.5%, especially those that are in that 1,000 to 1,500 pound range. If they're smaller, 500 to 1,000, they eat about 3%. If they're 100 to 500 pounds, three and a half percent, and less than 400 pounds, very small ruminants would eat four percent of their body weight. Those numbers were uh, given in the foraging intake lecture, so you might want to review those. So, what do you have to know to calculate the forage demand? You need to know the weight of the animal. You have to set some intake factor per weight of body, such as the ones on the previous slide. And then you would need to know how many animals you have and how long you want them to graze. So you're going to calculate what each animal is going to need during the whole season that you plan to graze. Then you just calculate the total demand per, per, per animal per season. Okay, let's do an example. If you had a herd of beef cattle and they weighed about 1,200 pounds for each and they grazed on the ranch for three months, that'd be 90 days. How much dry, air dry forage would you expect them to eat? Okay, a 1,200-pound cow eats about 2.5% of her body weight on a, a seasonal basis. Uh, that's 30 pounds of forage per day. 30 times 30 pounds times 90 days is 2,700 pounds per cow per season. And just for the fun, if you knew you had 55 cattle in your herd, how much would those 55 cattle eat? Now, it's not hard to do the math. You would take 2,700 pounds for each cow times 55 cows, and you'd have 148,500 pounds of dry forage for the whole herd for the whole season. Now, you can calculate forage demand in pounds per animal or pounds per herd like we have. You could also talk about it in terms of AUMs. Remember, an AUM is 750 pounds of forage. It's the amount of forage an animal unit, a 1,000-pound grazing ruminant, would eat in a month. So it's 750 pounds. The way you make that conversion between animals and animal units then is with that term animal unit equivalent that we d d described earlier. So an animal unit equivalent is the, the number of animals in an animal unit or the proportion of an animal unit that each animal is equivalent to. So it's probably easier to describe in, uh, in numbers than in uh, words. So here we go. So the number of animals times the animal unit equivalents equals AUM, equals animal units. So for example, in this chart, if you had six bulls, each bull is 1.35 animal units. They're more, they're bigger than an animal unit. So therefore, they're more than one animal unit. 1.35 is their animal unit equivalent. So you just take the bulls times 1.35 and six bulls would equal 8.1 animal units. If you had 270 goats, goats are a fraction of an animal unit. They are 0.15 animal unit equivalent. So there's uh, there's uh, each each goat equals 0.15 of an animal unit. So 270 times 0.15 is 40.5 animal units. Uh, elk would be another example. They're smaller than an animal unit. They're 0.6 of an animal unit. So 100 elk times 0.6 equals 60 animal units. Uh, these animal unit equivalent numbers are from the National Range and Pasture Handbook, but there are several of these kinds of you of um, charts available for calculating stocking rate. 
So now if you wanted to calculate forage demand in AUMs instead of pounds, we calculated it in pounds of demand, uh, you would just take the number of animals that you counted out in the pasture times their animal unit equivalent, and that would give you how many animal units you have on your ranch or your management unit. You would take those animal units times the months that you're grazing to get AUMs. For example, if you have horses grazing for six months, each horse is 1.25 animal unit equivalents times six months means that each horse eats 7.5 AUMs of forage, or you have to provide 7.5 AUMs for those for each horse in your herd. Um, if you wanted to express that in pounds, remember that an AUM equals 750 pounds. So you have, if you have 7.5 AUMs for each horse, and they eat seven, and each AUM is 750 pounds, then each horse for six months will eat 5,625 pounds. So see how you can easily convert AUMs to pounds of forage. Remember that uh, each AUM is 750 pounds in our example. Last step is calculate the stocking rate. Remember that a stocking rate has to include three things. It has to include a number of animals or animal units. It has to include an area hectares, acres, pastures, the ranch, and it also has to include a time. So unless you have those three points, you really can't um, compare animal uh, stocking rates across units. So, you know, for example, all of these would be examples of stocking rates. You could have acres per AUM, because that includes time, animals, and area. You know, you could have something like 15 cows per 35 acre pasture for four months, or even a flock of 450 ewes and lambs on the ranch for a year. All of those have the three elements and would be considered acceptable stocking rates. So that's it for the four-step method for uh, animal demand. Uh, calculate the usable forage, adjust for accessibility, calculate forage demand for animals, and then just uh, compare that forage demand and the forage supply to calculate the stocking rate. Okay, the, the devil again is in the details because there's no average amount of a forage animal eat um, on any day. They, they vary throughout the year and the amount of forage varies significantly from year to year. There might be a long-term average on your ranch, but some years you could have twice as much or half as much forage. So here's some examples of how much that variation can be uh, with crested wheatgrass in Idaho. Uh, in, this was a study that was done by uh, Lee Sharp, Ken Sanders, and Neil Rimby. And in 1957, when precipitation was 11.7 inches, grass production was 846. But then look just a couple years later in 1959 when they got um, not much less precipitation, but it must have come at a different time of year because now um, biomass is half of what it was in 57. And then look at 60, we have half as much precipitation and we have a fraction, just 186 pounds per acre. And then a few years later in 1971, when they had high precipitation, um, then the grass production was over a thousand pounds per acre. So imagine, try, imagine trying to set a stocking rate when, it, when the amount of forage supply varies from 186, about 200 pounds to over a thousand pounds. It's a, it's a big challenge. So how do you handle that challenge? How do you set a stocking rate amidst that variability? There's a couple of ways that uh, people would recommend. One is to have a, a pretty flexible stocking rate where no more than 60% of your herd is in breeding stock because your cows and ewes are the ones that are most difficult to kind of buy and sell on a short-term basis. And you would add that flexibility by um, using say stalker animals or leasing some of your, your grass out in good years and then not putting any extra animals on in bad years. An another way to do it is to have a a fixed herd, not very much from year to year, but have that, um, that number of animals set quite a ways below the long-term average, what you might expect in the long-term average. So for example, the NRCS calculates on the web cell survey, they calculate and give doc di details on stocking rates, I'm sorry, amounts of production in favorable, um, normal, and unfavorable years. If you were going to use that fixed stocking rate, you might set your stocking rate for the amount that would expect, be expected in an unfavorable year. Establishing the stocking rate again is best if you have past experience, if you know a lot about the current um, situation. Other things you might use are trying to think ahead, what's the long-term weather forecast? We're getting better and better at understanding how much forage there might be throughout the year. And you also want to consider financial goals that you might have, management objectives, 
perspectives, etc., etc. So there's many things that you have to consider besides just the math. So those are some details on setting up a stocking rate. Uh, in the class, if you go to the web page, there's a bunch of examples of, of how to work through the math and then some considerations that you might need to make. So setting stocking rate, again, is as much an art as it is a science, but there is some science and math involved. The key is to set a stocking rate, then monitor. With this method, you set a stocking rate. You can do it um, by trial and error or by calculations, and then monitor over year, from year to year to year. See if this, if it's working. See if you're having the amount of biomass left over at the end of the year that you're wanting. Um, also, looking across the pasture to see areas that are um, heavily utilized or or have low utilization. Um, in the, in, in the long term, you want to have a trend where the plant composition is really being maintained healthy over time. That would be a sign of, of good rangeland trend. So again, it's important to set a good stocking rate, but it's also important to monitor and see if that stocking rate is holding up.